Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. We are starting our uh, question answer session. As you have heard, Dr. Sar Ahmed has covered a vast area bearing both on ontological position of man and epistemological questions. It's a vast area. He has uh, very briefly touched everything. And now it's your time to question him. I hope you will not needle him. Because he's not a philosopher. He is a medical practitioner. Switched over to sw uh, spiritual healing, as I said. As I said, generally. But of course, he is a scholar of Quran. He has uh, studied Quran very intensively, very closely. Uh, this is a gathering of uh, multi-religious people, community from different uh, faiths have come here. And uh, we should meet in an ecumenical spirit hmm? and try to understand each other's point of view. Uh, let me start by saying uh, what a delight your presentation was and how clear it was and how much I appreciated it. Um, and there are so many questions I would like to ask, uh, but I'll, I'm, I'm very aware that there are others who want to ask questions too, so let me just pick one. And that was I was, I was interested in the way in which you reconciled the story of natural selection and Darwinian evolution appropriately modified with uh, the Quranic insights about uh, human anthropology, anthropology. And what surprised me a little bit is that my impression is the vast majority of Islamic thinkers are very suspicious of the sort of ideological baggage that uh, Darwinian evolution has in the West and view it therefore with a lot of suspicion and are often very, very critical of it. But you seem to be quite happy to talk about the fact that certainly the animal, human, did evolve from, you know, yes. uh, animals. And it was in some point in that process we were given a spirit. Uh, and how do you find that is, is, do you find you have a lot of sympathy in the Islamic world for these positions or do you find that you are often criticized for them? Thank you very much. Firstly, please note that I do believe in evolution but not in Darwinian evolution. Evolution is something else and the mode through which it has taken place is something else. The struggle for existence and the survival of the fittest and natural selection and that automatically changes one species to another. This is wrong. At every change of species we need another kun from God. And you know this, uh, the mechanism of uh, Darwinian uh, evolution has not been proved and not very much liked in the biological areas uh, in the academia. So every time we have to have a kun, and that change becomes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now actually the damage that Darwinian evolution has done to humanity is because of the focus on the animal being only. Man is not an animal being only. He is a spiritual being also. And that is out from the discussions or studies or quest of the scholars. This spiritual uh, existence has not come through evolution. It is direct from Allah, direct from God. So because this, this I, I said it is the, the calamity and the tragedy of modern mind that we have just shut our eyes from that side. And now if we are only animals, now we can follow animals. Animals don't discriminate between wife and mother and daughter. Why should we? They don't take the trouble of dressing. Why should we? This civilization has gone down to the animal level because the other aspect is absolutely out of sight. The whole sociology, whole thought is focused on the animal being. That's all. So that is the reason why Muslims don't agree with it. But if we have this idea that these two things are separate. This animal being has come through evolution, but for every change in the species was due to another new fresh command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so it has happened. 
your interpretation of uh, the origin and the birth and the development of the universe uh, it was very interesting and I think very beautifully and logically you weave the creationism with evolution. Uh, uh, I have a couple of questions. One is that you talked about three forms of creation, man, genies and angels. What three is forms of self-conscious self -conscious. creation. Yes. Okay. What is the qualitative difference between these three different forms of creations? And in your view, what different roles have been assigned to them, uh, what different capacities they have to perform these roles? The angels were created out of light and they are, so to say, the civil service, we call it. They are implementing divine commands. They have no animal existence at all, no lusts, no desires, no id, no libido. But then human beings, they have been blessed with spirits. But jinns don't have spirits. They are alive. They don't have spirits. Therefore, no revelation could come to them. Revelation only could be come to the human beings because they have that apparatus, that ruh, that spirit within them which receives it. The antenna is there. They don't have it. So, why student on earth is man. And he is the only creation of God in which both the worlds the world of Amr and the world of Khalq, they have come together. Jinnis are only Khalq, not Amr. And the angels are Amr, no Khalq. And here, you know, both have met together. The spirits belonging to the world of command and the animal being to the world of creation. I'm trying to relate here uh, in, in this very interest, interesting and for me very instructive uh, expo exposition that you have made today that the thought about the body itself uh, you I think also in some ways referred to as Kapra quoting open I, I suppose in a way that it's, it's a covering, which is, I, I think, in a way, the uh, Sikhism looks at it. The Kapra is, body is quoted, is named Kapra quite often in the uh, Guru Granth Sahib. And uh, Kapra, or the human incarnation, so to say, is the result of uh, your karmas. Karmi Ave Kapra Nadri Mok Dwar. And it is through the grace, Nadar, Nadar, Karam of God, that the Moksh, Moksha, uh, emancipation, salvation. Yes, salvation, the door of salvation only opens up through the uh, grace of God. But it is through your karma, through, through your doings, uh, through your. Uh, actions in, in your prior births that you got this human body. And this human body is then considered as one of the greatest blessings which has been given to you because it provides you the instrument, the sources of energy, the as you said, the thinking, the intellect, the ability to reason, the ability to see, to comprehend, acquire knowledge, gyan, and then try and get closer to, to God. And the biggest suffering is, where we start or begin, is the suffering from being separated from God, the Atma, the Spirit, being separated from God, the process of individuation. And in this process of individu in, 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 in individuation, the thing that comes up as, as the main obstacle 
in our ability to reunite with the eternal spirit is the so-called home or which I, I, once again I, I go fully with you when you say that surah has to be called surah and not a chapter because home I, I think people have tried to translate it into I am Ness or Ed or Ego or I was even impressed by the use of word Kudi by Lama Iqbal uh, and that and that is is the big problem that home dheera grog hai Home is the greatest melody. Daru bi ismahe. Daru, the melody, the remedy, also is in, in this. Because if there is God's grace, then it will put you on the right path. So what I was trying to figure out and uh, understand uh, is, is two aspects here. One is that how do we uh, envisage, how do we sort of uh, comprehend the role of the physical human body as such and the role of our ability to make choices which has been given to us by God, in other words human will, because that is where home, home comes in. So if, if you could elaborate on that for me. Uh, I'm thankful to you brother because you have given an exposition of your own which you, uh, do, is uh, in consonance with what I have said. You have used the very correct word instrument. This body is the instrument. Our ego or khudi or spiritual existence is the real existence. But it has to earn good deeds through this body or it is earning hell for itself through this body. And this is actually like a horse you have to ride. So your khudi should be strong enough to control the horse or it will throw you down on the ground. So both these things are necessary and there is, you know, the hadith of the Prophet, Inna li nafsika alayka haqqan Your, this body, animal body, has also rights upon you. You have to take care of it, everything. But don't think that you are only this body or animal being. Actually, your, your actual existence is a spiritual existence. What have been the reasons for the decline of the Islamic civilization with the basic characteristics that you have presented in your talk? Uh, maybe you will address that in a later subject. But my main concern here in the question is that your talk includes a number, uh, multiple layers of contradictions. Uh, that's to say there's a contradiction or dualism within man that you talked about. Uh, but there's also another kind of contradiction or dualism outside of man between perhaps different civilizations or philosophies or discourses. And since God is a central figure within the Abrahamic tradition, within Islam, it seems that uh, at the end of the talk you were somewhat pessimistic about human destiny. Now how come that God becomes absent here, although we are in, the, in so much need of God in the presence of contradiction, civilizational contradiction or human contradiction? How come that God does not interfere in order to restore that balance between the two entities that you spoke of? First of all, let me admit that this is global civilization, but it is as its origin was Europe. It's European civilization which has engulfed the whole of the globe. Regarding the question, God doesn't intervene. He has created this world, bestowed human beings with faculties, and now it is for them to show you know, man is being tested over here. What you do? So actually this will happen, but that was not the subject of my talk. Finally, we agree, both Christians and Muslims, the kingdom of heaven on earth is going to be established. It will be established. But first of all, we have to return to the basics because 
this western civilization or global civilization you are calling it has gone deep into our own intellects our own thinking our own value structure even we we are being you know subject to the same influences so allah will make the truth rule over the whole of the world i have a couple of questions about the second part of your presentation on human knowledge what i found missing in your epistemology is one thing your assumption seems to be that ideas generate ideas i'm talking about the right hand knowledge of physical objects in other words the intellectual sphere is an autonomous sphere what seems to me at missing is the idea of the social construction of ideas in other words ideas themselves do not generate subsequent ideas but philosophy and social science theories are the product of the socio economic conditions in which they are articulated would you accept that position yes going to the left side then i'll ask the other question actually what i said was that this acquired knowledge mostly it is the science knowledge of these physical sciences and then technology and that is the main subject today is the focus of human attention but because man wanted a total knowledge also and he needed it how to behave in this life and he did it some philosophy and along with that i should have added and i have on this that diagram the social sciences and you have to generate them and you have to build them and then you have to live by them yes going to the left side uh you have one box it calls the recorded in open revelation in islam i would assume that you mean that open and recorded revelation is contained in the quran right yes would you also include hadith hadith is this category side. or it's in the second box second box Which is, but uh, for the for the prophets this is also protected mm -hmm. the dreams the, that the prophet had were revelation for him and you know the inspirations because in surah shura we have three forms of wahi ma kana li basharin an yukallimahu allah illa wahyan aw bi waraa'i hijab aw yursila rasulan fa yuhiya bi iznihi ma yasha it is not possible for human beings to talk with allah except in three forms from behind a curtain just as moses had that communication conversation with allah on the the two and an inspiration directly from allah or a wahi coming through the angel and this wahi is the manifest the jali the recorded one but what is coming is inspiration that is the second aspect of wahi and for the prophets this is also protected so hadith is you know sort of a treasure of that wahi e khaf then the other two boxes one is called laws and injunctions and then the legal code i have two questions about that as far as the laws and injunctions are concerned are they permanent or on the contrary they are changeable are they time bound because as you know there is is a debate going on right now within the islamic circles what is permanent and what is changeable the other is about the legal code is this legal code directly revealed or is it derived from revelation in other words is it is it a human construction that is based on revelation or is it directly derived from revelation you mean sharia sharia yes what was the first thing the first was the 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 uh, is it permanent it is change? permanent and that's actually connected with the finality of the prophethood you know these laws were kept changing the law of moses was something else the law of muhammad is somewhat different but when humanity reached its puberty regarding this intellect then the final prophet came and this is for all time to come this is final 
permanent and till the end of this world. Now, Sharia actually is derived from the Jali Wahi from Quran as well as from the Sunnah, not Hadith. Sunnah is the practice of the Prophet, and we have two sources of Sunnah. One is the continuity of the practice of the Muslims. The companions saw the Prophet and followed him, and then you know the Tabi'een saw the companions and followed them. So this continuity is coming. This is one source, a bigger source of Sunnah. And the other is Hadith. So these are the two permanent sources of Islamic law, Sharia, Quran and Sunnah. But then there was Ijtihad. Actually, I have to talk about this subject when I talk tomorrow about the political structure of Islam. So this Ijtihad, you know, that is in changing conditions. When we have new problems, then we have to make Ijtihad keeping ourselves within the parameters of, of Quran and Sunnah. But you know we have to frame further laws. So Sharia now has this third element also. And that is why we have Hanafi school and Shafi school because they have their own judgments and ishtihad. And now Quran and Sunnah and ishtihad, they go to make one Sharia. I have a question. In fact, uh, maybe I have misunderstood uh, uh, about the case of Talim Asma. Now, this Talim Asma is the name of the things which is on earth or the names of the God. Uh, or, I mean, for us to understand God, to know God, because the basic thing that we have been sent to this world is to, to know God, to become to have knowledge of God. So I was, I mean, to my knowledge, I knew that Allama Asma, Asma here means the names of God, rather than being the names of the, the, the things on, on earth. Yes, so, brother, actually when I was talking about that, I said that there are more than one explanations of this. So one is which you are presenting. The other is that the asma and names of the prophets to come. That man has something good in him also. Although he will make facade and you know there will be bloodshed through this human beings. But you can see there will be Moses, there will be Jesus, there will be Muhammad wasallam. So this is another opinion. But my opinion is the one which I have presented. This is the knowledge of the material world. We Know something and name it. Okay. Is the, is, is the knowledge of material world different than the, the, the asthma of God, or, I mean, or uh, attributes of God? When we think, because God, in fact, creates things and then we know the things. No, this, this universe is. Because this is no, connected with the evolution as well. It's the shadow no? of only one name, and that is Khaliq. Al Mubdeh, Al Badi, that's all. But you know, this universe has so many things that we have, we have to know them and we have to name them. Every science has its own terminology. Unless you know that terminology, you can't understand their science. So I think yeah, this terminology and names of things. Uh, first, I'd like to also thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to follow Ibrahim's question and your answer to Ibrahim's question which I think fits into some of the things that you said. Um, uh, if we are, we, the collective we in this world, if we are going the wrong way to use collective language, which has been emphasized here, if God is not going to and does not intend to intervene, if indeed, as you also said, um, we only have, again, to use co uh, a colloquial language, voices in the wilderness who are advising us the other way, and we therefore cannot be, at this point, optimistic that the civilization's going the wrong way is going to change, then how can we expect the kingdom of God on earth to come about? When I said God doesn't intervene, I meant from beginning. The beginning has to be from human beings. They have to struggle. God has intervened, 
by sending his prophets, his books, his guidance. That is also intervention. Now it is for the human beings to follow them and to strive to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, the divine kingdom, the Islamic state. And that is our job. But when we are doing that, Allah will help us. God will help us. So that help will come. But without our own effort and endeavor, it is not going to come. He will not do it for us. We have to start, but then the help will come. But let me just press a little more, if oh, I may. Uh -huh. um, again, how can we be optimistic, given the present condition of the world that you described, how can we be optimistic that in the human struggle, things are going to change? And if I go to the Islamic belief that the final prophet has come, well, then how can we be optimistic that we're going to have other prophets who are going to come to help us? We, 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 can't, be, we can't even expect that. Yes, no new prophet is to come. But we have a concept in Islam of mujaddids, the revivers. And the Prophet said in every century, Allah will send people who will revive Islam and the basic thoughts of Islam and basic teachings of Islam. These are called mujaddids. And they have been coming in every century. So mujaddids will come. And then the divine help will come. And secondly, Although we, we, we believe that no new prophet is going to come, but Jesus is to come. He has to come again. We believe just like the Christian brothers, the second coming of Jesus. And through him actually, this is going to be a global kingdom of he heaven on earth. But it will start from among Muslims. At a critical juncture, when the Antichrist appears, we call him Dajjal. Then you know Christ will come Himself. He will descend. This is our belief. So that means that uh, the human agency would uh, would be futile somewhat. Not futile. Because but it will they will be crowned by something for help, you know, and this will be another help. Mm -hmm. But first of all, in Arabia, these are the prophecies of the Prophet, an Islamic state will be established. And before that, an Islamic state, state will be established somewhere in Pakistan and Afghanistan. Because the, the prophecy says that the armies will come from some eastern country to establish the rule of Mahdi. يَخْرُجُ نَاسُمْ مِنَ الْمَشْرِقِ يَوْتَّعُونَ لِلْمَحْدِ يَعْنِ سُلْتَانَهُ So this is going to be a human effort first of all. And then Allah will help. Mahdi will be the last mujaddid. And mujaddids have been coming. I have uh, another question uh, which is of a general nature about the type of discourse that you have presented which is not of course novel in Islamic theology since Muslims have been discussing that since the Tadween age in the second third centuries of Hijra uh, especially with the Ash'arite philosophy that you have presented so well today but there have been other types of philosophy within Islam such as the Mu'tazilite philosophy or perhaps Sufi philosophy and theology and so on and so forth. And this is a historical fact which I'm not going to dwell on very much. But what I'm concerned about is the type of education that we have in South Asia uh, nowadays, the type of Islamic education that has been commonly referred to as madrasa system. And the madrasa system is based uh, primarily perhaps on the type of theological discourse that you have presented. Uh, but the madrasa system in South Asia, especially in the, in the modern era, in the 20th century, 21st century, seems to be totally cut off from the concerns of contemporary Muslims. Although there is that balance in a normative way between the physical and the spiritual that you have talked about, but if, you, if we discuss the madrasa system in Pakistan, in India, in Bangladesh, in Kashmir, in Afghanistan, madrasa graduates do not seem to understand the modern world at all. They don't even seem to understand such basic Islamic issues as social justice, as an example. Yes. 
since they have no knowledge of the major problems of capitalism and the Western and the capitalist civilization which has become global. And therefore the question is, uh, if we believe that the normative discourse that you have presented is the correct discourse, but in actuality it is cut off from life, it is alienated from life, then the question is how can we establish bridges between this discourse and the contemporary needs of the, the Muslim world? Actually, this Madrasa system was devised to produce legal experts of Islam and the magistrates and judges on the Muslim governments. It has some relation with Hadith, but mainly it is fiqh. So actually, we should say this is out of the context, you know, it's mm -hmm. gone away. Now we are producing only Malvis who can lead prayers in the mosques, who can give you fatwa about very small things, you know, that's all. Because when Islam or Muslims degenerated, Islam didn't remain a deen, it became a mazhab. Now if the Britishers were ruling over here, the law was the British law, civil court, penal court, and so, and so forth. What was the job of the Muslim ulama? Leading prayers and teaching people how to say prayer and how to keep fast and that's all. And this part of our society has become accustomed to this part of deen only and that is mazhab and not really, not Islam. And they are not very much concerned with Quran. So we have to bring about an establish an educational system based primarily on Quran. So you're saying that the ulama in, let's say, Pakistani society are not concerned about the Quran? I think that is not included in their courses. Very mm -hmm. small part of Quran is included in their courses. They are more concerned with hadith and fiqh. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there is a large, I'm sorry, there is a larger <coughs> question about the status of the ulama in contemporary Muslim societies, specifically in South Asia. And from what you're saying, that the ulama are facing a major crisis Actually, in what terms happened, of their own Islamic When ideas. the Britishers came to India, hmm. now because a civilization, a military power with a scientific background, so we were so much obsessed with it that the ulama, they decided to go to the corners. They thought we can't, you know, have a confrontation with this civilization as this knowledge. So they can take them to corners so that at least name of Allah, name of Muhammad and name of Islam can be preserved. And that is why you know in India and Pakistan, Islam at least as a religion is very forceful. Not as a deen, not as a system, social system of life and just social order, no. So are we saying that the modern Muslim states that have come after colonialism have failed in retraining Muslim ulama in an Islamic way? Yes, definitely, I agree. Because actually, after the end of colonialism, so to say, it has not ended up till now, but so to say, the end of colonialism, the people who came to helm of affairs and the helm of affairs rulers, mm -hmm. they were all trained by our colonial masters. They were brainwashed. They were fully, accept, they had accepted the Western civilization. And they are ruling. So actually, the colonial rulers are ruling till today, by proxy. But we have an example of Iran where the ulama are in power. Yes. If we look at the Muslim scene in the contemporary... It's, that's the only exception and that was actually a political movement was hijacked by the ulama. So it, the Shias are better than us. Uh, they have proved yeah. that they have more power and endurance and the spirit of sacrifice. And you know this tragedy of Karbala has you know, persisted in their hearts. So this to lay down the <coughs> virtue of laying down your life. It is within their bones. What I uh, do see here is a uh, very altruistic uh, underlying 
uh, theme of the emancipation of the whole mankind as a as a part of the evolution or the development uh, through the development of the individuals. And I am trying to relate this to a pluralistic setting. And I am wondering that how would we conceptualize or envisage such a process taking place would it be only through the acceptance of this or would it be through a process of bringing the various thoughts together and somewhere emphasize and, and, and find a paradigm which really moves the humanity forward, the totality of humanity forward. And uh, in that process, I see that the role of change and acceptance of change will be a decisive factor. Now, how do we relate this entire concept in its more, more global setting and, and possibly the global future? Because I mean, if, if you look at the dem demographics, uh, I, I, I think uh, uh, th th there is a considerable amount of uh, problem inherent in the whole kingdom of God emerging. Yes, Brother Nidmal, truth is one, and the true deen is one, and we have to propagate it. But for that purpose, we have to emphasize not the dogma or the creed, but the system of social justice, which is the need of all humanity. For 300 years or 400 years, humanity is in search of some just social order. From kingdom, kingship, and you know these lords and barons and etc., etc., there was French Revolution, but it culminated into capitalism. So there was another revolution, Bolshevik Revolution. It has failed because it was not divine guided, the straight path. You know, in reaction you go to other extreme. So that was ex uh, uh, extremist. Then so now again we are back to capitalism and liberalism and secularism and so on. But there will be another step in which humanity will go. But for that purpose, at least in some one sizable country on the globe, we must establish that socio-politico-economic order of Islam so that people can see with their own eyes, this is Islam. What we have been fighting against was something else. This is Islam. So that is the answer to all the questions humanity is facing today. And that is why now America, when they say we are not against Islam, they are saying true. They accept Islam as a mashab, as a religion. And it comprises of three parts. Some creed, a dogma, beliefs, some forms of worship, some social customs what to do with the dead body and how to solemnize the marriage and how to celebrate the birth of a new baby, etc., etc. Well, you can have any belief. You can come to America, buy a synagogue, turn it into a mosque. You can come to America, buy a church and turn it into a synagogue. We have no objection. We are ready to embrace you, but not the political, social, economic system. That is ours. It will remain ours. We don't accept any divine revelation or divine guidance regarding these things. Now, what was the point of difference between the USSR and uh, the Western world? For half a century there was going Cold War, but what for? The political, social, economic system. Otherwise, the Russians and all these countries, Eastern European, they were also Christians. And Western Europe and America was also Christian. There was no, no fight of creed or something else. It was the system. 
सो हु सो एवर इज गेनिंग बाई दिस कैपिटलिस्टिक सिस्टम ही हैज टू प्रोटेक्ट दैट सिस्टम एनी हाउ एंड ही विल हैव टू गो टू एनी एक्सटेंट टू गार्ड देयर इंटरेस्ट इन दिस वर्ल्ड एंड दे फियर इस्लाम ओनली एज ए पोलिटिकल सोशो इकोनॉमिक सिस्टम नॉट एज ए मजहब नॉट एज ए रिलीजन they can keep all the religions at par in america yes you can make a gurdwara you can build there go there and hindus can build temples and go there whatever you do but nothing doing our secular liberal and then our capitalistic system can i um, just come back to this chart for a moment and and perhaps pick up on on something Uh, which we have touched on, and that is, there are many texts in the world, many texts, many books, in the world which people claim to be infallible. You know, conservative evangelicals such as George Bush and others would talk about the Bible in those sorts of ways. Certain Jews would talk about the Torah in those sorts of ways, the Bhagavad Gita, Tripitaka, and, and so you can go on. When when you Can you just clarify how do you know which is the the book which is protected and immune from error and satanic influence how do you know which book has that status that has to be a historical research Quran throughout 14 centuries has remained as it was Bible has not there were revisions changes you know Ahmad Didat, you know, <laughs> he had this subject specialized in that subject. Uh, regarding Torah, the Jews also believe that the real Torah is no more there; it was destroyed or buried uh, in the tunnels under that uh, Temple of Solomon in the year 587, when Nebuchadnezzar has, had invaded and demolished the, that temple. so i can say this thing about my torah and injil only regarding the scriptures of the indians they are not sure who were the authors of the upanishads who were the authors of the vedas they are prehistoric type of things but quran you know is in the light of history full light of history one one other question about this chart um and that is do you have any sympathy there there are some in the in Europe who argue that the rise of science the rise of scientific learning needed to emerge from a theistic and religious framework because of course it's the assumption of faith that the the world is ordered which makes it possible for people to investigate it so Do you have any sense <coughs> that actually you need religion to create the possibility of science? I think this uh, hypothesis is historically wrong. You know the days of the Muslim, the Abbasids. They had the background of Islam and science, mathematics. You know all these things, medicine. They flourished. We got those things from. Greek Greek sources and from Indians developed them, and we had the background of belief in God and religion, and we transferred it to Europe through the universities of Cordova and Granada and Toledo. But because you know the rule of Pope in in those days in Europe, which had prohibited science and philosophy both, that had created. an anti religious sentiment among the masses so when science started developing it had that anti religious color in it that is the real cause at superficial level there seems to be a contradiction between science and religion but i think what he was saying was that there is a continuity the fundamental foundational philosophical assumption of science is that life in universe has an order and this is a religious truth so science built on that metaphysical idea 
and try to find out the, the nature of order in the universe. So the, the, all the developments in philosophy of science, particularly in physics, and I think Dr. Abdul Salam had this notion, and he was hammering it again and again, that whatever developments in modern physics are taking place, they are fundamentally derived from the notion of order that we inherited from, from, re from religion. So that was probably, yeah, is that true? That's exactly yeah. right. Yeah. So in that sense, there is no inherent contradiction between science and religion. But I want to go back to... But I never said sure. there is contradiction. Mm -hmm. These are two things side by side. I never said there is contradiction. There is a difference between saying side by side and saying that they yes, it's built on that. There is a continuity. There is a qualitative linkage between the two. No, but only one truth that there is order in this universe doesn't go to make its religion. Mm -hmm. The belief in one God, creator, mm -hmm. that is the basis of it. And he is the guider to the right path. That's why modern physics is going to the idea of finding, trying to find a unified principle in the universe. Anyway, I want to go back to this whole, uh, to the chart. That is the framework which is very lucidly uh, articulated and I really compliment you on that. My question is, you divide uh, the human knowledge, what you call religious truth, into two categories, protected, which is immune from human error that you describe as revelation, prophetic knowledge, knowledge that we receive from the prophets. And the other is the knowledge that we gain from intuition, dreams, illuminations, and... and ESP. ESP. And also, <coughs> going to the right uh, side of your, uh, this uh, chart, from knowledge from reason. My question is, is it possible to come up with a set of ideas independent from guidance from revelation that is capable of guiding us to the truth. Is it possible to reach the truth by sheer human reason? One. Secondly, is it also when we say that the whole idea is to find the religious truth, is it possible to find this truth through several paths? For example, the whole idea of interfaith religious dialogue that is taking place in the West is that the fundamental religious reality is the same. And there are different paths, methods to find that truth. Uh, I'm not saying that it will not be subject to uh, error. error, but I just want you to entertain the possibility, just the possibility. Of that there are certain other ways to find the truth, independent of prophetic guidance. Actually, to know God, there are so many ways and paths. <coughs> but to know the path, straight path, that is by revelation only. And this revelation has been coming time to time. And according to the mental or intellectual development of humanity as a whole, there was a development in that also. Till it reached its zenith in the person of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So we have to accept for the right path this revelation which has been given by Allah for the humanity, all of humanity for all times to come. As you know, that Quran says, Wama arsalna ka illa ka fatal linna se bashiram wa nasira. He is the only prophet who claimed that I have been sent for the whole of humanity. Even Jesus said, I have come to find the search of the uh, lost sheep of the house of uh, Israel. And Quran says, all prophets came for their own nations only. Etc., etc. He is the only one who says, I have been sent for the whole of humanity. So you do not that I can live a, a moral life on the basis of secular ethics? Yes, you can live. It will be basic human morality. Basic human morality. To, to speak the truth, not to deceive anyone, not to rob not to steal. These are things which Quran says 
دے ہیو بین امبیوڈ ان ہیومن نیچر الحما فجو رہا و تقوا یو دس ڈس یو نو اٹ ہیز بین امبیوڈ وتھ دس بٹ دی پاتھ اسٹریٹ پاتھ وٹ ٹو ڈو وٹ ناٹ ٹو ڈو دیٹ از سم تھنگ ایلس دیٹ کمس فرام دی پروفٹ ہوڈ What would you say is the hope for us uh, Christians and Jews in your view of the future? The final shape of humanity is going to be Islam. When Jesus Christ comes, he will say, I was not crucified. This crucifixion is a fiction. And I had told you that the law of Moses will remain. So Christianity and Islam, they will merge together into one religion under the leadership of Jesus. Because according to the Quranic philosophy, whenever a messenger was sent to any community, if that community as a whole rejected him, it was annihilated. This happened to the people of Noah. This happened to the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And this happened to the people of Ad. They are, they are not mentioned in Bible, but in Quran. They were Arabian, ancient Arabian nations. Samud. To the people of Shoaib. Then, you know, Pharaoh and his armies were drowned. Because they didn't accept Moses as, as their prophet. Jesus came as the messenger for Jews. And Jews as a whole didn't accept him. But Judaism does contain the idea, the idea of the Messiah is Judaic. So Judaism, in a theological sense, does not deny the phenomenon of the Messiah. And throughout history, and I'm talking about modern history, there have been a number of Messiahs who have claimed that uh, position. And one major one in the Ottoman Empire in the 17th century uh, was, I forget his name now, uh, Shabbatai bin Svi. Shabbat Arben Sfi in the 17th century claimed that he was the Messiah on the basis of Jewish foundational ideas. So I, I don't see your point because in Judaism the idea of the Messiah is not absent at all. No, it is, it there. is still there. But that Messiah come to them. They didn't accept him. Jesus. So with, yes, Jesus. That was the Messiah. And he said, he claimed, I am the Messiah. Right. But they didn't accept So the seat is vacant up till now. So they are waiting for their Messiah. And someone will stand up to, someday and claim to be Messiah and lead them to, you know, the greater Israel and, and so on and so forth. Anyone can come. And that will be Antichrist. I think also we are too far away from the basic subject. Now you said that we have two forms of knowledge. We have? Two forms of knowledge. Yes. Okay? But what about the source of knowledge for Islam? I mean, what sources that Islam accepts that true knowledge comes to us? Both knowledges are true. No, I mean, this is the knowledge of this universe. And universe is the creation of God. So is one source. And that is why all the physical phenomena are referred to in Quran, mm -hmm. ayat of Allah. Mm -hmm. They are the signs of Allah. Yeah. So actually, Quran to us is the word of God. And this universe is the work of God. And there's no contradiction between the two. So they are same. Yes. In, in one sense. One is coming from Kalam, the other one is coming from. Because I said, Allah Adam al Asma Kullaha from God. So this all is your scientific advancement is from God. Okay, we are now again <laughs> okay. to the subject. <laughs> Thank you.